Hello, hello. Welcome to the iLog channel. My name is Casey, and thank you so much for joining me for today's video, where I'm going to be doing a deep dive into and ranking the entire discography of They Might Be Giants. First up, a little background. They Might Be Giants is a band from Brooklyn, New York that formed 100 years before the year 2082. It consists of John Flansburg and John Linnell as its core founding members and primary songwriters. John and John knew each other as teenagers growing up in Lincoln, Massachusetts, and made some rough home recordings together. Eventually, young adult life split them apart, but they found themselves again together living in the same building in New York City. From these apartments, the dream of making music would begin again. 42 years later, and they are still making music together and writing new material. Personally, I've been aware of the band since I was a child. The album No had come out not long before I was born, so I grew up listening to that a ton of times. I even eventually fell in love with a select few songs from their first few albums. And I would get reintroduced to the band when I would discover the Here Comes the Blank series of kids records they had done with Disney. I would be passively aware of the band for a few years before getting re-reintroduced to them in 2018 when the song I Left My Body became one of my favorite songs to practice drums to. However, it wasn't until 2021 when my obsession with the band truly began. The Live at the Hall of Williamsburg, November 29th, 2015, was being offered as a free download. I took the opportunity of, hey, free music, and downloaded it. I'll get more into detail about this album later, but this proved to be the gateway drug into my absolute love for the twin quasars of rock. For this video, I've chosen to rank the songs in a tier list format to clearly visualize my opinions. This tier list, however, will only go from D to S tier. I've excluded an F tier because while there are some releases I don't like as much as others, I really wouldn't go as far as to say I hate anything the band has ever put out. With all that being said, let's dive headfirst into the discography of They Might Be Giants. Chapter 1. The Early Years In the starting years of the band, Linnell had a bad bike crash and was unable to play shows. This led John and John to put together the Dial-A-Song service, a phone number people could call and an answering machine would play a song directly into their ear for maximum listening pleasure. The instrumentals from these recordings would often end up on tape and used in the band's unique live show format, where John Flansburg would play guitar and sing, and John Linnell would play accordion and sing, and occasionally also play saxophone. Bass, drums, and whatever other instrumentation that the band couldn't provide live was played off the tape, and the tape machine was operated by friend of the band and sound engineer Bill Krause. This brings us to the first major release of the band. The 1985 Demo Tape Created by making recordings both at home and by buying the cheapest studio time they could get, They Might Be Giants put together a promotional tape that was sold at $6 a pop. It featured 23 songs, most of which would get re-recorded for their studio albums up until about Apollo 18. However, experimental songs I'm Deaf and Become a Robot and the grimy pop number Hell Hotel would never see official re-recordings. For the most part, I prefer the album re-recordings of pretty much all the songs, though I do like the biggest one here as it just has a little bit more edge than the later released single version. I also enjoy specifically the breakdown section in Cowtown a little bit more, uh, as it's just brighter and less heavy than the album version, but overall I do think the album version is better. It's not all roses though, I really don't think Flans' vocals work on Hotel Detective, and Linnell sounds like he gave up halfway through singing Nothing's Gonna Change My Clothes. But other than some minor hiccups here and there, this is a good release, especially if you're interested in a detailed history of the band, or you just like it when TMBG sounds a little bit more lo-fi. Honestly though, I don't think this is something you absolutely have to hear from the band. B tier. The Pink Album They Might Be Giant's first album, called They Might Be Giants, though often referred to as The Pink Album by fans, or The First Album, 
was released four years into the band's existence in 1986. It features a lot of the same songs from the 85 demo, but with better production and performances. The album starts off really strong with the first four tracks, though I feel that number three is a little bit out of place quality and just songwriting wise. I get why they put it there. I mean, having a song called Number Three be the third song in the track list makes a lot of sense and is, you know, humorous, but it just doesn't mesh well with the other opening tracks. One of the best qualities of this album is the variety of musical styles. Experimental electronic, rock, polka are all seamlessly blended together by the Johns. The standout tracks for me are Hideaway Folk Family with its strange and explosive bridge, and Nothing's Gonna Change My Clothes, its imagery of skeletons and dominoes really reminding me of the work of Walt Whitman, the photographic artist behind the I Spy and Can You See What I See children's books. The sound of the album is kind of distant. Lots of reverb and the more lo-fi production stops anything from really jumping out at you. And despite Accordion being one of the band's most notable features, it feels almost overshadowed by the presence of electric organ on this album. The Johns also let out their experimental side, something which we'll see manifest in different ways in their later albums. But we never quite get songs exactly like Toddler Highway, Chess Piece Face, Rabid Child, or Boat of Car, which are all very conceptual. Some things will come close, but they'll just never quite hit that mark. This is a good start for TMBG, but personally, I don't think it has the same highlights as some of their other albums. B tier. Lincoln. Released in 1988 and named after the John's hometown of Lincoln, Massachusetts, TMBG's sophomore album is a real leap both sonically and technologically, featuring the, at the time, brand new Alesis HR-16 drum machine and just a much higher production quality. The sound of Lincoln, in my opinion, is much improved over that of the Pink album. Acoustic instruments especially often sounded very, very distant on the Pink album, but on Lincoln are up close and in focus. Acoustic guitar, accordion, and even the occasional auto harp are just present and just right there. Of course, this applies to the other variety of instruments as well, as they aren't completely drenched in reverb like on the Pink album. I also think John Linnell's vocal performance is greatly improved here. He just sounds more confident, like he just found his footing after making that first album. Flans' voice was never really lacking to me on the first album, and he sounds about the same here. Like Pink, a lot of these songs showed up on the 1985 demo tape, but unlike Pink, they have more differences than similarities. You'll Miss Me went from a soft sort of rap thing to an outright insane display of self-importance. And Cowtown has some darker and more distorted guitar during the breakdown, as well as some fun blippy vocal samples. I don't really know what to call it, but they're these short little ooh ah, just like dotted in, and it's really fun. The selection of tracks on this album is also stacked. Where Your Eyes Don't Go, Piece of Dirt, Mr. Me, Pencil Rain, They'll Need a Crane, and Stand on Your Own Head are some amazing tracks, with my personal favorite standouts being I've Got a Match and Snowball in Hell. I really adore the sound of this album. It's the perfect blend between lo-fi and hi-fi, and there's enough tasty melodic hooks to satisfy even the hungriest of listeners. A tier. Miscellaneous T. This is the first point where I'm going to go out of order from release chronology in favor of keeping the different eras of the band more properly aligned. Miscellaneous T was put together in 1991 to compile the various B-sides and rarities that had accumulated since the release of the Pink album. It runs in reverse chronological order, starting off with the Lincoln B-sides and rarities and ending with the Pink Album B-sides and rarities. Though half of these songs are from the Pink Album, I find they just have a more polished sound than the Pink Album, leading me to kind of treat this in my head as like an alternate universe first album for They Might Be Giants. Anyway, the songs presented here are great. Hey Mr. DJ, I Thought We Had a Deal has a fantastic hook, 
Lady is a Tramp is a cover of an old musical song with a great early MIDI sound. Nightgown of the Sullen Moon, All Sink Manhattan, and It's Not My Birthday are a great triple threat presented one after the other. And The Biggest One, For Science and When It Rains It Snows, are great examples of some more of that early TMBG weirdness. I appreciate the boldness of the remix of The World's Address, uh, taking sections of the original song and then having these long sections of, like, completely unique melodic material in between. It's a fun listen, but the transitions can be a bit jarring. Miscellaneous Tea is a fun deep dive into some of the band's rarer material from this time. Though like a lot of the band's b-sides and rarities, I'm left scratching my head as to why some of these songs never made it onto the main albums. They really are that good. A-tier. Then, the earlier years. Breaking release chronology again, then the earlier years was released in 1997, and compiles The Pink Album, Lincoln, and Miscellaneous Tea. However, it also contains some extra rare material that hadn't been released before. Since I've already covered the material from Pink, Lincoln, and Miscellaneous Tea, I'll only be covering the new material presented on this album. The various band intros that were used live are pretty fun, as is the 85 radio special thank you. However, the best things by far are the high quality versions of Weep Day, The Big Big Whoredom, Become a Robot, and the demo of which describes how you're feeling all the time. A quick aside, Become a Robot was one of my favorite songs as a kid. Uh, my dad had gotten a copy of then the earlier years from the library and ripped it to the computer. And one day I think him and I were going through all the songs and the only one that stood out to me was Become a Robot. Look, I don't know what child me was thinking either. I must just not have paid attention to the other songs because I cannot believe I wouldn't have been interested in any of the other ones. But yeah, that's the one I enjoyed. Anyway, I think this is a really good compilation album. It has enough chronological value to be useful for new fans who want to get into the band's music and want a convenient listening order, and it has enough rare material for diehards to really want to dig into it. However, the exclusive material on this album just isn't good enough to really give it a higher ranking, so I'm going to go with B tier. Chapter 2. Electrified TMBG found success from their first two albums thanks to MTV music videos and college radio stations. This led to larger labels expressing interest in the band, culminating in a deal between They Might Be Giants and Elektra Records. The band would be signed under Elektra from 1989 to 1996. This would allow the band to explore regions of song recording that had previously been out of their budget and would lead to one of the most important albums for their career. Flood. They Might Be Giant's brand new record for 1990, Flood, was and still is their best-selling album, and is probably the first, or even only, album that a lot of people have heard from them. It was their first album to be recorded digitally, and their first album to be created while signed under Elektra. This leads to the album having a much higher production value than anything else that had been released by the band before. Though there are a lot of sonic improvements, I find that most of the songs just sound like something that could have been on Lincoln, just with higher fidelity. I also find that the songwriting on this album is, on the whole, a lot less dark than some of their other works. Though that's not to say there aren't some great songs. Birdhouse in Your Soul, Lucky Ball and Chain, We Wanna Rock, Someone Keeps Moving My Chair, Whistling in the Dark, Women and Men. There's a lot of good material present here. Of course, I have to mention Birdhouse in Your Soul as a standout. It's one of their most beloved songs, and for good reason. It's a really good song. Uh, it's also the song that a lot of people probably know them for, or have heard, and don't actually know who the band is. Flood is a good album consisting of good songs, but I find it just lacks that edge that I really enjoy out of a TMBG project. I can see why it's their best-selling album, it goes down easy, but that's part of why I find it a bit boring. It almost goes down too easy, it's too palatable, it's 
too appealing. It's too good. And so I have to give it a bit of a lower ranking. B tier. The Istanbul, not Constantinople, EP. This was the EP released alongside Flood and was one of the first to establish the main Electra era EP format, which would usually go as follows. Single from the album, two or three B-sides, and then a remix of the single. This EP contains Istanbul, not Constantinople, from the album Flood, three B-sides, James K. Polk, Stormy Pinkness, and Ant, and then ends with a remix of Istanbul. James K. Polk is, I believe, TMBG's first original educational song that they would become known for. It's an upbeat and energetic look through the history of the man that the song is named after, or at least his brief presidential career. Stormy Pinkness is a vibe and a half. It's this very ambient, slow rock, almost reminiscent of old 50s and 60s rock. Uh, it's probably my favorite track off this EP, and it's worth a listen if you've never heard it before. Ant is Flans being Flans. These three songs are interesting because, to me, they sound a bit lower quality than everything else on Flood. It puts them in this weird middle ground, not quite as lo-fi as Lincoln, but not quite as hi-fi as Flood, instead being in this strange middle ground. The remix of Istanbul, not Constantinople, is fine, though I think it goes on for a little bit too long. Overall, this is a pretty middle-of-the-road EP for me. Uh, Istanbul isn't one of my favorite songs, so getting to hear it twice doesn't do much for me. The B-sides are a nice addition to Flood, but they're also not amazing, you know? C-tier. Apollo 18. TMBG were no slumps after their big hit record, and came swinging at full force in 1992, putting The Rock in Twin Quasars of Rock with Apollo 18. This album knows what it wants to be, and it knows how to be it. Opening with the searing track, Dig My Grave, it sends a very clear message. This ain't the TMBG of before. In my opinion, Apollo 18 is the peak of classic duo TMBG. The instrument programming has never been as good and as detailed as it is here, and the sound is much more rock forward, without abandoning their more experimental roots with things like fingertips and spider. In my opinion, this is the peak of classic duo They Might Be Giants. The instrument programming has never been as detailed and intricate as it is on this album, and the sound is so much more rock forward without abandoning their more experimental side with projects like Fingertips and songs like Spider. Darker and more mature lyrics supported by the John's amazing melodic ability really solidify this as the best of the classics in my mind. The drum fills on The Statue Got Me High are some of my favorite little bits. Uh, they're so varied and detailed despite just being programmed. Songs like Mammal, Dinner Bell, and Spacesuit were personal childhood favorites of mine. Turn Around is a wonderful little blues about detached heads. And Hall of Heads is a song about detached heads. I'm noticing a pattern here. The album also delves into more pop-like elements, though not all pop from the same decade. The Guitar, She's Actual Size, My Evil Twin, I Palindrome Eye, Narrow Your Eyes. The only song I'd really even consider to be a bit of a dud on this album is Hypnotist of Ladies. It's a generic Bo Diddley beat with lyrics that don't really come across as dark and interesting, and they kind of just come across as uncomfortable. And of course, who could forget the amazing experiment in CD shuffling technology, fingertips, making every listen of the album slightly different, though shuffling it would have done that anyway. And while I don't think the concept of fingertips quite landed how it was supposed to, the micro songs are still fantastic and are an amazing show off of the John's writing ability. Just catchy hook after catchy hook and spacesuit. Having it end off the album is really kind of poetic. It was one of the first songs ever written for TMBG, so 
having it kind of be the grand send-off to the duo age of the band before they got a full backing band, it's kind of sweet. I have nothing but good things to say about this album. I love it so much, which is why it's going to be the first to be S-tier. I Palindrome I. The first of two Electra era EPs for Apollo 18. It of course features the song that the EP was named after, I Palindrome I, Cabbage Town, an interesting but low energy track, definitely one of the times where I can see why this didn't make it to the album. Sifton, a very midi sounding instrumental that I just love. I'm a sucker for TMBG's instrumentals. Their melodic ability is just astounding. And ending off the EP, instead of a remix of I Palindrome I, we get Larger Than Life, a song that is classified as a remake of She's Actual Size. It's essentially just a completely new song that uses a sample of Flans' vocal from She's Actual Size. Overall, this EP is alright. I don't like the B-sides as much as I like others and it just feels kind of small. I have to admit, Sifton is doing a lot of heavy lifting for this ranking. B tier. The Guitar, The Lion Sleeps Tonight EP. The second Apollo EP overcorrects on the smallness of I Palindrome I by giving us three different versions of the guitar. Version number one is nearly identical to the album version, but features like two bars of a bass fill towards the end of the song that I guess got cut from the album mix. And it should also be noted that this version is here in place of the album version. Version two is called the Outer Planet Mix. It's a fun enough remix, but it goes on for way too long. And the third version, labeled Even Further Outer Planet Mix, is identical to the Outer Planet Mix, but just doesn't contain any of the samples from the guitar. Listening to this EP all the way through from start to finish is a real test of mental strength. The Outer Planet Mixes are just way too long, and there's no reason that they need to be on here twice. It's just way too much. The B-sides are nice, though. Welcome to the Jungle is a fan-favorite obscurity, and I think that love is well-deserved. I Blame You is too similar in vibes to Cabbage Town to really stand out in my mind. And Moving to the Sun is a fun, kind of reggae-ish track from Flans. The B-sides are the only thing saving this EP from D-tier. Having to listen to the six and a half minute remix of the guitar twice is crazy. And if it wasn't for Welcome to the Jungle, this EP would be D tier. But instead, I'll be placing it in C tier. A quick aside, when the tour for Apollo 18 began, both the Johns and Elektra agreed that the band had gone as far as they could with just two guys and a tape machine. And so the decision was made to include a full backing band for this tour for the first time in They Might Be Giants history. This group consisted of Kurt Hoffman on keys, Tony Maimoni on bass, and Jonathan Feinberg on drums. Why Does the Sun Shine? The Sun is a Massive Incandescent Gas EP. Released in between Apollo 18 and John Henry, Why Does the Sunshine is an interesting EP, as it's not really tied to any one specific album, and doesn't follow the established format of single, b-sides, and then remix of the single. Instead, Why Does the Sunshine serves as almost a teaser to what was to come in John Henry now that TMBG had a full backing band. Though going into the studio, the lineup of the band had changed a little. Kurt Hoffman was now absent, Brian Dotry had replaced Jonathan Feinberg on drums, and Graham Maybe had replaced Tony Maimoni on bass. Recorded in the same session as the John Henry demos, we'll get to those next, don't worry, this EP consists of three covers and one original song. 
Why Does the Sunshine is a minimalist cover of the 1959 song by Hi Zaret and Lou Singer. It's a song that actually dates back pretty far in They Might Be Giants history, being one of the songs that John and John had been performing live for years by the time this EP came out. The song would also prove to become quite popular later in its life, but this was when a live version was released that was far more upbeat and rockish. We'll cover that later. Jessica is an instrumental from the Allman Brothers Band, originally released in 1973. I think TMBG do a really good job with it here. And honestly, until I knew it was a cover, I thought it was an original song with how melodically driven it was. And the last cover is the 1992 song Whirlpool by the Meat Puppets. I love the way they chose to cover the song. It has essentially a saxophone quartet consisting of what I believe is two baritone saxophones and two tenor saxophones, and the arrangement is so good. The original song at the end of the EP is the full band demo of Spy. This song would later get completely re-recorded for John Henry, but I think this demo version is honestly better. The improv at the end is tighter and doesn't drag on quite as much as the final John Henry version. Overall, I really love this EP. They did a great job with the covers, and the introduction to TMBG's new full band sound is really good. S tier. The John Henry Demos Recorded before the main sessions for John Henry in 1993, but not released to the public until 2018, the John Henry demos represent an interesting time in They Might Be Giants history. Having never worked with a full band in the studio on an entire album, they wanted to make sure everything going into the final sessions was going to be incredibly solid, leading them to demo out what they thought would be the full album with the band before the final recording sessions. Because these songs are virtually identical to what we see on John Henry, I'm not going to be reviewing them on the quality of the songwriting, but focus more on production elements and how they differ to the final album versions. So essentially, this section's going to be me running through the notes I took while I was listening. Sleeping in the Flowers just doesn't have the same punch as the album version. The horns especially sound weak, though I do think the acoustic fade-out at the end is quite funny. Unrelated Thing is just kind of sleepier than the album version. The more exciting outro on AKA Driver is nice. The vocal rhythm on Why Must I Be Sad clearly hadn't been finalized by this point because it's completely different on the album version, and the album version is much better. This version of Spy is the same version that you can hear on the Why Does the Sunshine EP, and my opinions on that still stand, this is the better version of Spy. The notes I have for No One Knows My Plan and Thermostat are the same. What is going on with the processing on John Linnell's vocal? It doesn't sound like it's an issue with his performance, rather it sounds like decisions that were made in either the recording phase or the mixing phase. I'm more likely to believe it was in the recording phase since they sound very similar to each other. For some reason, his voice is just super bitey and overcompressed. like. The bitiness could come from poor EQ choices, or them just using the wrong microphone for Linnell's voice, and the compression just sounds off, like there's way too much of it going on. The setup for these recordings may have been done in a hurry so they couldn't get the best sound, or maybe they were just experimenting and trying to push the bounds of how they were producing John Linnell's vocal, but I'm glad this experiment didn't work out. His voice never sounds like this on any future project, and I'm glad because it just is not the right sound for his voice. Moving on, this version of Dirt Bike isn't as good as the album version, in my opinion. The horn parts just sound weaker, and it's completely lacking the guitar solo, which makes the song sound more like a fragment of an idea rather than a fleshed out song. Destination Moon just sounds a bit weaker than the album version. A Self Called Nowhere has this extra little trumpet line in the pre-chorus that I really enjoy. I'm not really sure why it was cut, and Meet James Enzor has this more loose and driving sound that actually makes me enjoy this version over the album version. As for any of the songs I didn't mention, they were just too similar to the album versions to be noteworthy. Overall, this is a fun bit of TMBG history. It's one of the few releases of album demos that we have, 
It's also one of the few times that TMBG actually demoed out an entire album intentionally before recording it. And while some of the songs are highlights, I generally prefer the final release of John Henry over these demos in most cases. C tier. John Henry. After the Apollo 18 tour featuring a full backing band, the decision was made to bring the full band into the studio to work on what would become 1994's John Henry. The album features a starkly different sound compared to what had come before from They Might Be Giants, focusing more on real-time rock arrangements instead of experimental sounds and programming. The opening of the album is incredibly strong with Subliminal before diving into a wash of music that, for They Might Be Giants, is experimental, just in a different axis than people were used to hearing from them. This album is a limb stretch of what it's like to have a full band, uh, being able to experiment in styles that they couldn't before, like the country sound of Unrelated Thing. In addition to guitars, bass, drums, and keys, full horn sections also make a major part of the sound of this album. Songs like Sleeping in the Flowers, Dirt Bike, No One Knows My Plan, and A Self Called Nowhere would be half the songs they are without the horn sections. Now, the Johns had used horns before, but usually this just consisted of John Linnell playing saxophone. These are full horn sections. Some of the songs on this album are also darker than we've ever had before on a They Might Be Giants album. Destination Moon tells the story of a terminally hopeful patient who believes that they will someday go to the moon, when in reality they don't even have a working set of legs or Stomp Box, which while bordering on parody, still has an unrelenting darkness to it. I'll also add that both of the Johns are on fire here. None of these songs ever really fall flat to me. And of course, I've only mentioned a small handful of the songs present on this album. My all-time favorite song has to be A Self Called Nowhere. My favorite song from this album has to be A Self Called Nowhere. I love the way it grabs a hold of you and doesn't let go until the end as it drags you down a spiral of the narrator's detached reality. Heavy, dark, grungy, maybe even gothic, but still with a solid sense of humor. John Henry is a fantastic addition to the They Might Be Giants catalog. A tier. Back to Skull. Also released in 1994, and following the Electra era EP format, though interestingly not being named after the single, instead having a wonderful pun as the title, Back to Skull features Snail Shell, Undine, She Was a Hotel Detective, Mrs. Train, and Snail Dust, which is just a remix of Snail Shell. I really like the b-sides that are present here. Undine is this sort of bluesy number with a really great chorus. She Was a Hotel Detective is a follow-up to the song She Was a Hotel Detective, and is a sort of upbeat disco thing that actually led to the creation of another TMBG song, How Can I Sing Like a Girl. And Mrs. Train is a really humorous song, presumably about getting run over by a train that just gets faster and faster and faster as the train quickly approaches. As for the remix, Snail Dust is fine, but it doesn't really deviate much from the original, it's basically just the vocal track being played straight through with a different instrumental. It's fine, if a little boring. Overall, this is definitely one of the better EPs from this time period. B tier. Live, New York City, October 14th, 1994. You'll never believe where and when this live album was recorded. Interestingly, this live album kind of plays out like a radio show, featuring interjections by host Donna Donna in between breaks in the set. This is also the first live album from the band. Despite being a show from around the time of John Henry, only four of the songs from that album are present here. Oh Do Not Forsake Me opens the show and is performed up two half steps from the original key, most likely to make singing the lowest note a bit easier. AKA Driver, Sleeping in the Flowers, and Snail Shell are the other John Henry songs that are performed. One of my favorite parts about any TMBG live album is the goofiness, the stage banter, the way the Johns interact off each other and tell stupid jokes, and that's really lacking here. 
And it's a shame to have such a major part of the band's personality stripped out of a live album, especially one that's not a live compilation, but is just one whole show. Those are where I usually expect stage banter the most. Overall, it's a nice historical capture, but it's not my favorite live album from the band. B tier. Quick aside, another shift in the backing band would occur between John Henry and the next album. Hal Cragen would replace Graham Maybe on bass, and Eric Schmierhorn would occasionally show up as a lead guitarist. Factory Showroom The second full band studio album, and the last studio album to be released on Elektra, 1996's Factory Showroom tones down some of the darkness from John Henry in favor of more comical darkness and experimentation not unlike what was seen on the Pink album. However, unlike Pink, there's a level of polish and completeness that soaks even the most novel of songs. Speaking of songs, there's an absolutely great selection here. Till My Head Falls Off is an upbeat descent into a spiraling stream of consciousness that Linnell is so good at writing. How Can I Sing Like a Girl is Flans moving more into the power pop territory that he'd become so well known for in the later years of the band. If Exquisite Dead Guy had worse production quality, it would fit right at home with the Pink album. Spiraling Shape is one of the best examples of Linnell's amazing lyricism. And James K. Polk from the Istanbul EP returns here, and I have to say I like this version a lot better than the original EP version. Pet Name is probably one of the few breakup songs to leave you with a smile, and The Bells Are Ringing closes off the album with a similar lyrical concept to Spiraling Shape, but with more of a focus on the whole society versus the individual. The sound of the album is completely different from John Henry. Gone is the grunginess in favor of more that mid to late 90s smoothness. We also get more obvious synthesizer use here, which really helps tie the album back to They Might Be Giants' roots. Overall, I think Factory Showroom is a great compliment to John Henry. A tier. For some reason, SEXXY was chosen as the lead single for Factory Showroom, despite there being clearly much better options to use. The Electra era EP format is present once again, single, b-sides, remix. Though much like the guitar EP, this version of SEXXY presented as the first track is actually a slightly different mix than the album version. The string outro is cut completely, and there's these reverse cymbal hits added between different sections of the song. The drums also sound notably different to me. I wonder if this was like a different take of drums, or just they were processed much differently, but they seem punchier? The B-side selection here is amazing though. Sense Around is a re-recording of the song, the original recording being used in the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers The Movie soundtrack. Like Welcome to the Jungle, this seems to be a well-loved B-side by the fanbase, and it's a shame that we've never had a and it's a shame that we've never had a more major release for this song or even a live performance. It really is such a good song. Unforgotten is like a 60s ballad of plucky guitar lines and immense sadness. We've Got a World That Swings is a cover of an old song and is the first TMBG song, I think, to use a toy piano. It's also not the last time TMBG would cover an early 20th century song using a toy piano. Though we have about 30 years of material to cover before we get to that point. As for the remix, I actually quite like it despite it being almost 7 minutes long, and I think it holds up well against the other officially released TMBG remixes. Overall, though this EP has a good set of b-sides, I'm baffled as to why a different song like Till My Head Falls Off wasn't chosen as the single. B tier. Chapter 3. They Got Lost after a falling out with Elektra Records, TMBG bounced around a bit, having music released through Restless Records, E-Music, and Rhino Records. This era of the band is quite notable for just how much material was released during this time, and how little of it actually contributes to the main canon of the band. 
Of the 28 releases I'm going to be covering here, only seven are part of the band's core output, and only three of those are studio albums. Despite seeming a little bit hectic, this time period actually ended up being quite mainstream for the band. Uh, they made the theme song for Malcolm in the Middle, and even made some bumper songs for Cartoon Network. Severe Tire Damage Up until this point, TMBG had always had two years between studio album releases. However, in 1998, instead of a studio album, we got Severe Tire Damage, a live compilation album that features a couple studio tracks. Unlike the live New York City 1994 album, this isn't just one show but is instead a best of of a bunch of different recordings that were made across the Severe Tire Damage tour, the tour that was supporting Factory Showroom. In contrast to the live tracks, there are three studio tracks that are present as well. Dr. Worm is here, though this song was released as a single around this time, and so it feels more like a bonus inclusion of a single than anything else. It's a very popular TMBG song, though it lacks any of the darkness you'll find in their deeper works. It's kind of similar to Birdhouse in that regard. This is followed by the severe tire damage theme. It really just acts as a barrier between Dr. Worm and the live tracks. It's a short game showy intro sounding instrumental that's pretty fun. About Me is the third and final studio track, placed after the live tracks but before the bonus tracks. As such, there's about two minutes of silence following the song in order to prevent the average listener from finding the bonus tracks. The song itself has a nice horn arrangement, but is very short and kind of forgettable. As for the live tracks, there's some great performances presented here, including two songs that had yet to have studio album releases. They Got Lost is a song that wouldn't show up until Long Tall Weekend, and it's presented far more up-tempo than the final studio version. And the song First Kiss is a upbeat power pop song that wouldn't get a release until 2001's Mink Car though the version presented there is very different from what we hear on this album. Also presented here is the upbeat, high-energy rock version of Why Does the Sun Shine. Once They Might Be Giants had a full backing band, this is how the song was usually played live, but we didn't get a studio recording of it until 2009. The other live tracks have really solid arrangements, and notably two guitars, as TMBG had expanded their live band by this point. After the two minutes of silence following About Me, we get the Planet of the Apes tracks. These are just a series of live recordings that were improv by the band across different shows. Generally speaking, I'm more of a fan of live show albums than live compilation albums, but this one's pretty okay. You get Dr. Worm, First Kiss, They Got Lost, and Why Does the Sun Shine, which make it pretty worth it. B tier. Another aside about the backing band, during the Severe Tire Damage tour, Dan Miller would take over as the permanent lead guitarist, Danny Weinkoff would take over on bass, and Dan Hickey would become the new drummer. This would lead to the infamous Band of Dans. Because hey, who doesn't want to see a band made up of two guys named John and three guys named Dan? Long Tall Weekend Long Tall Weekend was released to eMusic in 1999, and features a bit of hodgepodge of material. Some of the songs are new recordings, some are taken from as far back as the John Henry and Factory showroom sessions. This leads to this album being kind of an odd case between full studio album and compilation album. Despite that oddness, there are some pretty amazing songs here. Opening the album is the song Drinkin', an instrumental that has proven to be one of my favorites. It's got a great arrangement and a great melody. Rat Patrol is a fun riff on, like, 80s hair glam rock kind of thing. Older has a great melody and counter melody. Operators Are Standing By is another look by John Flansburg into working class tedium, a subject he would write about quite a lot. I enjoy the slide guitar on Darken Metric. Reprehensible is like a sequel to Kiss Me Son of God about the hollowness of greed. Certain People I Could Name is an amazing lyrical adventure and shows off the way John Linnell is able to take small moments and turn them into exponential detail. They Got Lost has some good guitar work, Lullaby to Nightmares has a great horn arrangement, and On Earth My Nina, which is John Linnell's lyrical interpretation 
of the song Thunderbird, which wouldn't be released until 2004, but was often played live during the late 90s. Also worth noting is the song Dr. Evil, which was included in the 2023 re-release of the album. This song was made for the Austin Powers movie, which originally was supposed to feature a parody of Dr. Worm replacing Dr. Worm with Dr. Evil, and I don't see how that rhyme scheme was supposed to work. The rhythm just isn't right. I'm glad they ended up doing like the James Bondy sounding thing. This album is kind of a weird highlight for me. Due to the fact that it's kind of just a bunch of stuff thrown together, it feels like it wasn't afraid to hide its rough spots. It's loose, it's relaxed, it's just fun and lighthearted while still being a bit dark. Honestly, it's a great listen. S tier. Working undercover for the man. Released in 2000, this EP is much like Why Does the Sun Shine? Not in the sense that it has covers, but in the sense that it's not really tied to a specific album release. The EP opens strong with Rest A While, one of Linnell's best rockers. Working Undercover for the Man, the title song of the EP, shows this kind of vulnerable insecurity that can come from being a performing artist. This is actually a subject that Flans would cover again in 2018 with the song This Microphone. Human Head is a great set of Linnell lyrics with some awesome guitar work. Empty Bottle Blues is an instrumental and has some great orchestration. The song On the Drag just has a great energy to it, and there's this moment when the tempo drops and then slowly comes back up. It's killer. There are some radio jingles that TMBG wrote that are present here. They're fine. And the adult version of Robot Parade, which has a weird Beatles-esque mixing where the vocals are all on one side and the instruments are all on the other. There's another song where we're going to see this technique used, and it's just as weird there. This EP has a pretty solid set of songs, and is a nice introduction to what post-millennium They Might Be Giants would sound like. A tier. TMBG Unlimited was a service offered in collaboration between They Might Be Giants and eMusic. Users who signed up would receive a free album every month from January 2001 to January 2002. The songs ranged from rarities, demos, to even previews of They Might Be Giants' upcoming albums, Mink Car, and No. My reviews for these albums are going to be pretty short, as there's a lot to get through. January. Up first is January 2001. There is no official album artwork for this one, so I'm using a fan-made version from This Might Be a Wiki. I think the Mink Car demos on here are interesting, and it's cool to hear more of the Edison Museum Wax Cylinder session present as well. I find the Love version of Stormy Pinkness to generally be kind of boring. C tier. February. Next up, February 2001. The only unique track here is an alternate version of Bangs. Every other song would get released somewhere else. D tier. March. March 2001 features a pretty interesting instrumental. The sounds Clown Town and Monsters of Mud are cut songs from No that I think only ever showed up on a special preview version of the album that very few people have. The live recording of When It Rains It Snows is interesting as well. C tier. The Flood Show. Also released in March, this is a full live show of TMBG playing Flood. This is our first live album release to have uncut stage banter, though most of that stage banter just consists of the Johns talking about how unprepared and unrehearsed they are for the show. And honestly, it kinda shows in some parts of the performance. The big highlight for me is the absolute chaos that went into this version of the song They Might Be Giants, and it transitions shockingly well into Road Movie to Berlin. C tier. April. Up fifth is April 2001. There's slightly different versions of Finished with Lies and Fibber Island. 
a cover of Ram On, and some classic TMBG live performances as well. There's also some other songs, but they matter more when they get reviewed somewhere else. C tier. May. There are some interesting demos and a fun live improv battle. I wrote in my notes that the volume levels were all over the place. This is honestly an issue that would persist throughout all of TMBG Unlimited. D tier. The Ritz Show. Also released in May, The Ritz Show is an entire live show presented with stage banter, but not focusing on one album like The Flood Show. There's a live performance of the adult version of Robot Parade, which is fun to hear. There's also some live mink card tracks, which I appreciate because sometimes it feels like that's an album that gets left out of a lot of TMBG's live album releases. There's also a performance of the up-tempo rock version of Why Does the Sun Shine, but it features one of my favorite TMBG bits. So for some reason, when They Might Be Giants would play this song live, when they'd go through uh, in the middle of the song, there's like a part where they're like, the sun is so hot that everything on it is a gas, and then they'd list off a bunch of different elements that are gases. Well, at some point, they decided to mess around and started listing things that weren't elements. Uh, hair was a common one. And eventually, this just devolved into them saying estrogen. Not mixed in with other words, but just saying estrogen <laughs> over and over again. The sun is so hot that everything on it is a gas, including estrogen, 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 and estrogen. And it's such a dumb bit, and it's so funny, and I love it. And this is really one of the best versions of Why Does the Sun Shine, purely just for that. You can find other live recordings of them doing this bit on YouTube, and it's so worth a watch, because it's, it's just so ridiculous. The They Might Be Giant-centric podcast, Don't Let's Start, has a YouTube channel, and on that YouTube channel, there's a video where they just cut together all the various things that They Might Be Giants ever did in live performances of this song, it's just an endless listing of elements, and as you get further and further into the video, it just devolves from all these crazy things to just, like, <laughs> minutes straight of them just saying the word estrogen, and it is hilarious and definitely worth checking out. I'll try to remember to leave a link to that in the description. There's also a live version of Working Undercover for the Man, a song I don't think I'd ever heard a live version of before. And there's a performance of She's Actual Size, which starts off normally. Uh, the band plays through the song and then goes into a Dan Hickey drum solo, which was typical for performances of this song at the time. But when they pick back up into the song after the drum solo, they play it, like, incredibly, remarkably slow. And like the Why Does the Sunshine estrogen bit, this is also hilarious. I don't know if this was, like, an accident or if it was on purpose. I don't know, but it's... <laughs> so weird and so amazing. There are some technical issues with the album. The mix isn't always quite balanced right, and there's some noticeable distortion where it doesn't sound like they're supposed to be. For instance, the vocals are nearly completely drowned out by the guitar in Birdhouse in Your Soul, but this gets quickly corrected like halfway through the song, which makes me think, I don't know, the sound engineer fell asleep at the board or something. Oh yeah, also, uh, just another funny thing about this show, Linnell sings the last line of Birdhouse in Your Soul in German. This is definitely one of the more unserious They Might Be Giants live shows. There will be some other deeply unserious moments in later live albums, but this one's honestly a hoot and a holler. B tier. June. In June 2001, you'll never guess what was released. That's right! Another TMBG Unlimited album! It starts off with some mink car previews, whatever. The second half's a bit interesting. There's a demo of I'm Your Boyfriend Now, and an early live version of Museum of Idiots. There's also a song, Tender is the Mind, which has a great melody, but the performance is really rough. C tier. If you're wondering now if all the TMBG Unlimited albums are going to end up in C-tier, 
Yeah, most of them are. July. I think July 2001 is one of the longest TMBG Unlimited albums to not be a live album. Though it does feature some live tracks. It starts off with some covers that the band did live with a horn section, then goes into some old dial -a song tracks, and then ends with some early live TMBG material, which is always really interesting to hear. Honestly, this is one of the Unlimited albums that's more worth a listen than others in my opinion. It's still C tier though. August. August 2001 starts off a bit weird. There's a live version of I Palindrome I that fades out at the end when the crowd starts cheering. And then within the fade out, you hear the intro of the song that they played next, which is Twisting. And then the very next track on the album is that live performance of Twisting. So you hear the intro of the song twice. And I don't get why they didn't either cut the fade out sooner or just have the songs just go right into each other without putting a fade out in. Anyway, there's also another Wax Cylinder song here, which is a good way to complete the set. And the song Rocket Ship, which would later get digested into spiraling shape. C tier. September. September 2001 has some songs from the Battle of the Bands project. Something that never really saw the light of day, it was basically just TMBG creating a bunch of songs in a bunch of different styles, labeling them with fake band names, and then I presume that they would put them all together on an album and call it Battle of the Bands, but this never saw a release. There's also a really interesting rough mix of They Might Be Giants from Flood, and an old demo of Cabbage Town. C tier. October. We're almost done here. There's more Battle of the Bands tracks in October 2001, including one which is a parody of late 90s, early 2000s pop punk that I really enjoy. There's another Planet of the Apes track. To the Bubblecraft sounds like a parody of old like 60s and 70s sci-fi TV shows. There's another song, but I'm going to save that one for a review of a different EP. C tier. November. Up at number 13, it's November 2001. There's some more Dial-A-Song stuff here. I really like the song Tiny Doctors, and the mystery track is an ad for Coca-Cola that Flans had made. There's a live fingertips performance, which is fine. There's some other live fingertips performances that I prefer, though. There's The Car Crash, which is about what you think it would be from a TMBG live show. There's also two really interesting demos, one of Particle Man, which has a notably different melody and rhythm, and Drinkin', performed in acoustic by just John and John. C tier. December. And here we are, the last TMBG Unlimited album. I'm not counting January 2002, it's just a compilation of other tracks from Unlimited. There's no new material on it. December 2001 starts off with a live recording of Spin the Dial, something TMBG would do in their live performances where they would just turn a radio dial till a song would come on and then they'd play along to the song, sometimes really well, other times not. This one has a good little bit of While My Guitar Gently Weeps in it. There's a Dan Hickey drum solo spotlight and a live version of Dr. Evil with Robin Goldwasser. And then there's some other TMBG oldies, and some holiday-specific songs, which I'm saving for a review of a different EP. Can you guess where this one's gonna go? That's right! C tier. Songs for Chop Created seemingly between 2000 and 2004, and then not released until 2016, Songs for Chop collects the promotional material that was created by They Might Be Giants 
for The Chopping Block, a graphic design studio that they worked with on multiple occasions. The songs themselves are okay, even if they're just advertisements. I Got My T-Shirt Back is fine, and there's some Flans and Linnell flavored versions of the song Oranges. The origin of the song Robot Parade is present here with Robot Design. Prisoners of Graphic Design is kinda funny. And Chopping Block Testimonial actually shows up on a couple other releases by They Might Be Giants, and <laughs> it makes me laugh every time I hear it, because it's mixed with the song Oranges, just the instrumental of it, mixed all the way in the left side. And then in the right just comes in this isolated, dry, no reverb, very compressed voice of John Flansburg just saying, Hi, this is John from They Might Be Giants. You might know me as that guy from They Might Be Giants. And just having a song start off with a John Flansburg jump scare gets me every time. It's kind of funny. I'll just say now that I'm going to rank this one low, even with the more okay songs. I find the advertising tactic being used a little distasteful. I don't know, maybe the whole we take pride in being severely overworked thing was like more marketable back in the early 2000s. But yeah, D tier. They Might Be Giants versus McSweeney's. They Might Be Giants vs. McSweeney's is a soundtrack created for Timothy McSweeney's Quarterly Concern, a magazine that started in 1998 and seems to still have new releases as of today. For its sixth issue, TMBG created a bunch of music that would go along with different parts of the magazine. Some of the songs here aren't from TMBG, and one of them is from John Linnell's solo project, State Songs, but everything else is TMBG. The songs range from instrumentals to full songs to these short little bumpers. There's even a new version of Bangs here that's notably different from the Mink Car version and the TMBG Unlimited version, because we needed a third version of the song Bangs. There's also a different version of Drinkin' from Long Tall Weekend. I also want to mention the song Frog and Banjo. This one isn't by They Might Be Giants, but by friend of the band Mike Doty. It was recorded in John Flansburg's home studio, but it's completely not associated with them in any other way. It's a hilarious song. It, it's worth a listen if you can find it on YouTube or if you can find a copy of TMBG vs. McSweeney's. It's a remarkably funny song. McSweeney's is a fun listen if you're trying to go for the complete They Might Be Giants experience, but I don't know, it's not worth going out of your way to listen to if you don't care about TMBG's non-album material. C tier. Mink Car. Released September 11th, 2001, Mink Car was kind of overshadowed by other events that happened that day, especially given that They Might Be Giants is a band that operates out of New York. Yeah. Taking into account that Long Tall Weekend was a limited release, Mink Car was the band's first studio album since 1996, and five years was quite a bit longer than their usual two-year turnaround. Due to how long they had to work on the songs, this album is sometimes considered to be overproduced by some fans. I do agree with this to an extent. The songs definitely are produced in a way that's very different from They Might Be Giants' other albums, but I don't think it detracts from the songs. In the same way that John Henry is very mid to early 90s sounding, Mink Car is unashamed to be very 2000s sounding. And hey, overproduced or not, there are some awesome songs on here. The powerful pop rock hooks of Cyclops Rock, the joyous club-inspired journey into overstimulation with Man It's So Loud in here, what is probably TMBG's best love song with Another First Kiss, a softened version of the original upbeat rock song from Severe Tire Damage, the hilarious I've Got a Fang, hopeless bleak despair, because I think we all need a song in this world that just has a chorus where you get to just shout hopeless bleak despair. And Linnell proves his humorous side once again with Wicked Little Critta. Honestly, I'd say in general, Linnell is on fire on this album. I'd also say that with how experimental this album feels, it's more like the Pink album than any other album, which is probably why it's so divisive among fans. It's so experimental that it's almost not TMBG. 
Of course, all this level of experimentation means that, yeah, there are some high highs, but there are some low lows. <clears throat> Mr. Excitement. <clears throat> oh, also, Your Mom's Alright, which is one of the 2022 bonus tracks. <clears throat> There's also a couple remakes of other songs. She Thinks She's Edith Head, which was present on Long Tall Weekend, uh, it fixes the issue of the original version, where the instruments were all on one side and the voice was on the other, and she uses a more normal stereo mix. But the vocal performance is also much more weak. Flans is now doing the song down an octave, and it just sounds weird. They also remade the song older. I think each version of the song has its own charms versus the other, though my favorite version of the song will always be a demo version, where they actually have a vocal version of the counter melody that's usually played on the bass. It's really cool. It only comes in at the end, but it's a fun version. Man It's So Loud In Here and Hopeless Bleak Despair are definitely the highlights for me, and I think though this album can be a little bit controversial, it's really good. It's definitely a product of its time, but I don't mind that too much. A tier. The Man It's So Loud In Here EP. Do you like Man It's So Loud In Here? I know I do. Do you want to hear it three times in a row? Then this is the EP for you! So, yeah, it features a radio edit of Man It's So Loud In Here, the album version of Man It's So Loud In Here, and a remix of Man It's So Loud In Here. And while the remix is decent, it's stylistically nearly identical to the original. And look, I love this song, but no b-sides? No rarities? The Australian release of this EP did include some b-sides, but the US releases are the ones counted as canon. And anyway, those b-sides were rectified as they would later get included in the 2022 re-release of Mink Car. So, yeah, you get three versions of Man It's So Loud in here. Do I even need to explain it? D-tier. They Might Be Giants in Holiday Land. Released in November 2001, this EP compiles all of They Might Be Giants' most festive songs. Most of these songs have been released elsewhere. Santa's Beard is from Lincoln. Feast of Lights, Santa Claus, and O Tannenbaum are all from TMBG Unlimited. I told you we'd get back to those songs. In fact, the only reason this EP even counts in my ranking is because of one unique song that technically is from a completely different project. Careless Santa is a song that was recorded by John Flansburg's side project, Monopuff. And though this technically isn't a They Might Be Giants song, it's on a They Might Be Giants release, and so therefore acts as the only unique piece of material here, making it qualifiable for a ranking. On to the songs themselves. I really enjoy the song O Tannenbaum. It's a live recording taken from a sound check, if I'm not mistaken, and the horn arrangement is really great. There's also Feast of Lights, which is an old song being covered with a toy piano. Not the last time they'll do it, though. And it just has a really great melody and chord progression. Santa's beard really sticks out like a sore thumb here. Being from Lincoln, it's noticeably more lo-fi than every other song being presented. But overall, I like this EP. It's fun. It's holiday. It's yay! Snow and winter and festivities. Yippee! C-tier. No. 2002 saw They Might Be Giants delve into the world of making children's music for the first, and definitely not last time, with their album, No. This is an interesting album to be sure. It's the last song to feature John John, Dan Dan, and Dan all on the same album. And it was the first album to be released on TMBG's own label, Idlewild. We'll get more into that later. This album showcases a sound that doesn't really sound like Mink Car, but also doesn't sound like the albums that would come after, which in my opinion makes it the kind of transitional album when we got away from the early TMBG sound into the modern TMBG sound. The album also has a really comforting sound, which I think works well for something that you're going to be presenting to children. Despite being made for children, though, the songs aren't reduced in quality. The John's sharp lyrics and intricate arrangements are ever-present, as always, just with less depressing elements. Depends on whether or not you consider waiting so long for a date that you grow old and die depressing. 
Eh. Or the portions of George Washington's head that get cut up in violin. Or the outright horror that is the ending of Fibber Island. I don't know, that song always scared me as a kid. The ending to Fibber Island freaked me out as a kid. Or like the entire vibe that Edison Museum brings. Okay, so maybe this album is a little more horrific than you might think. Being a kid's record though, it seems like they were willing to play a little bit more loose with things. For the first time ever, we have a song present on a They Might Be Giants album that's not a cover and wasn't written by one of the Johns. Bassist Danny Weinkoff wrote and sings the song, Where Do They Make Balloons? This would continue on through the rest of the children's albums. They were the only place where the other members of the band were able to write songs. Now, I mentioned some of the songs off this album before, but I want to mention some more that deserve a name drop. Robot Parade, I Am Not Your Broom, Wake Up Call, and the entire ending set of songs of Lazy Head and Sleepy Bones, Sleepwalkers, and Bed, Bed, Bed. These are all fantastic songs. I'll also add that in 2012, for the 10th anniversary of the album, some digital exclusive bonus tracks were also released. However, most of these bonus tracks are just live tracks from a live album that we're actually going to cover later. The one unique studio track is an alternate version of the song Alphabet of Nations, which the original version of is from a completely different kids album that, again, we'll get to later. This alternate version is based off the arrangement they would use when they'd perform the song on TV, and honestly, I think it might be a little bit better than the original Here Come the ABCs version, especially that bridge section. Oh. Yes. Spoilers, I guess. Overall, I think the John's versatility really shines here. Even when they can't write songs about your skin burning off or human heads everywhere, they can still write really good music. And hey, this is a good way for parents to indoctrinate their kids into They Might Be Giants at a young age. B tier. They Got Lost. In 2002, TMBG released a compilation album that I think handles its own name pretty well. They Got Lost. Given how just weird TMBG's release structure was following their departure from Elektra, I can see how it'd be easy for a more casual fan of the band to kind of get lost in all the material. So this album compiles material from Long Tall Weekend, TMBG Unlimited, and even McSweeney's, which is a great way, I think, to give some of these more obscure songs a second chance. Though why am I talking about it if it's all compiled material? Well, much like the next compilation album I'm going to talk about, there is one unique song on here. I'm Sick of This American Life is the one unique song to this album, and it's fine. It feels a little bit thrown together. There's some really bad clipping in the middle of the song. The keyboard parts are nice, though. This compilation definitely serves its purpose, but I'd rather just listen to Long Tall Weekend. C tier. Dial a song. 20 years of They Might Be Giants. The other compilation that features one unique song. Dial a song, 20 years of They Might Be Giants, was created to capitalize on the momentum and mainstream popularity that TMBG was experiencing in the early 2000s thanks to their involvement with projects like the theme song for Malcolm in the Middle. What can I say? It's got the hits. It's got Birdhouse. It's got Anna Ang. It's got Bossamy. Don't let's start. Dr. Worm. It's got the hits. However, what it also has is a unique live recording of She's Actual Size. It's a pretty fun version of the song. Dan Hickey's drum solo is pretty good. Oh, and also I share a birthday with this song. Oh, and I guess I'm a liar. Technically, there is one more unique track here. See, when they were putting this compilation album together, they grabbed the wrong version of James K. Polk. It's nearly identical to the factory showroom version, but it's slightly different. I don't really feel this is worth mentioning since it's a mistake and wasn't an intentional rarity release. Just someone messed up and grabbed the wrong master recording. Anyway, yeah, this is a fine compilation album. Like I said, it's got the hits. C tier. The Partly Cloudy Patriot. In 2003, TMBG made some music for an audiobook called The Partly Cloudy Patriot. The songs are mostly just short instrumentals that I assume would have played between chapters, though four of them do interestingly have lyrics. The songs mostly focus on an acoustic sound, 
woodwinds, brass, guitar, and accordion make up the sonic core of this album. There's a nice vibe, and it's worth a listen if you want some TMBG, I guess Americana, if that's the right word for this. C tier. They might be giants, other thing. While this wouldn't see a release until 2016, it was originally recorded in 2003. And were also some of the first studio recordings made to feature Marty Beller, They Might Be Giant's current drummer and the eventual replacement of Dan Hickey. Other Thing takes existing TMBG songs and reimagines them in a more acoustic format. Uh, acoustic guitar instead of electric, there's a three-piece horn section, there's accordion, drums, everything is a little bit more laid back here. A few of these songs would get released on other EPs and other projects for a little while until 2016, but this compiles all of them in one go, except weirdly for Boat of Car, which only would receive a release on the 2011 compilation album, Album Raises New and Troubling Questions. I don't know why this one was left out. The reimagined songs that are present here are Ant, which I think is better than the original version, Stalk of Wheat, Dirt Bike, it's hard to pick, but I might like this version just a little bit better than the album version. Particle Man, a cover of the Beach Boys song Caroline No, which Flans does a really good job singing. Mr. Me and Metal Detector. The horn arrangements are really great and give way to some nice alternate versions of these songs. B tier. Bed, bed, bed. Released in 2003 as an EP follow-up to No, Bed 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 has the distinction of being attached to a book that contains all of the lyrics and some fun illustrations to go along with them. This is the first, but notably not the last time, TMBG would have a music release that accompanied a book that had lyrics in it. But we'll get there. The songs themselves are really good and kind of overshadow what was on No. Impossible is this upbeat dance song about self-expression, and I honestly think is one of Linnell's best kid songs. Happy Doesn't Have to Have an Ending is a crazy catchy earworm. Idle Wild is a very sweet and calm song. And there's a new soft version of the song Bed 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 from No. I think I actually prefer the No version better. Though to be fair, this EP version actually sounds like something that would make a kid want to go to bed, as opposed to the album original, which is so high energy that you'd think it'd make him want to wake up. Overall, though, this is a really solid EP. A tier. Chapter 4. Idlewild. Well, They Might Be Giants finally settled on a record label. By making their own. Idlewild recordings technically began in the previous chapter with the releases of No and Bed Bed Bed. However, this is the point going forward where Every release is going to be under Idlewild in some way or another. In this section of the band's history, we see even more commercial success by making three more children's albums in collaboration with Disney. This collaboration would also net TMBG a Grammy. These children's albums also proved to be the only exception to the rule of everything in this chapter being released solely through Idlewild recordings. Indestructible Object the Indestructible Object EP was released in 2003 and mostly features songs that would be released elsewhere, except for Am I Awake, an electronic song that captures the high-energy exhaustion of insomnia, and a version of the song Au Contraire that, while nearly identical to the album version, does feature a flute solo instead of a guitar solo. Am I Awake is definitely pulling the ranking of this EP up. It's really a great song, and if you've never heard it, it's available on this EP and also on the Idlewild compilation album. It's a fantastic song. B tier. The Spine. Almost in stark opposition to the polished sound of Mink Car, 2004's The Spine focuses more on an indie rock band kind of sound, with arrangements that sound like they'd be easier to recreate live. The raw and big sound of this album would prove to be a new blueprint for TMBG going forward, and even when deviations from this sound occur, you can still tell a clear difference between pre-spine and post-spine They Might Be Giants albums. 
This is also notably the last album to ever feature Dan Hickey on drums, though he's only on two songs, Au Contraire and Memo to Human Resources. Marty Beller has taken over the role as the main drummer by this point and is on every other song. As for the songs themselves, I find this album to be a bit more middle of the road than other TMBG albums. Like, there are good songs, but I don't feel that they ever quite hit the same highs as other albums. Though, in all fairness, this album also doesn't really have any major lows. It's kind of just there. It's more consistent, but a little bit more unremarkable. I will say, though, that Wearing a Raincoat, Prevenge, It's Kicking In, and Thunderbird are some pretty good tracks. Now that TMBG had come into their, what we now know as their final form with John, John, Dan, Danny, and Marty, it feels like this was this new complete band's baby steps. They would go on to make some great music later, but they had to start somewhere, and The Spine is kind of that record. This album also lacks a lot of the in-your-face strangeness that a lot of other TMBG albums have. A lot of those weirder, stranger songs would get pushed onto The Spine Surf's Alone EP, which we'll be covering next. Maybe after coming off of the success of Boss of Me and No, they wanted an album that would have more mass appeal, but I don't think that works in the album's favor. B tier. The Spine Surf's Alone. Released as a companion to The Spine, The Spine Surf's Alone is said by the band to be one of their scariest works yet. Yeah, sure. The material is dark, for sure, especially darker than what's on The Spine, but I wouldn't call it scary. It's more comedically dark. It's dark in a way that kind of makes you smile, not dark in a way that terrifies you and makes you want to hide in a corner. Regardless, these are some fantastic songs present here. This EP gets its own theme song with the song The Spine Surfs Alone. It's this really energetic, gritty, just kind of go track, and it reminds me a lot of tracks like Dig My Grave from Apollo 18 or Stomp Box from John Henry. Now is Strange follows next, and it's one of my favorite weirder TMBG songs. Linnell writes about this strange character who sees hidden numbers underneath other numbers, underneath doorbells. It's, it's great, and it's really worth a listen. I'm All You Can Think About is hilarious. <laughs> it's this story of this tiny-faced creature who embeds itself into your mind, and it's the only thing you can think about for the rest of your life. Fun Assassin is a nice song. It's a duet, but interestingly, there's no John's present singing on it. Scullivan is another pretty hilarious song about some kind of butler or servant or something. I'm not really sure. The vocals are super blown out, distorted, and there's this really cool gating technique implored, like rhythmic gating at the end of the song. It's really cool sounding. The Other Side of the World, or The Spine Surfs Alone Part 2, depending on who you ask, is a short instrumental that's much more upbeat compared to the rest of the EP. And finishing off the EP is the song Canada Haunts Me, a duet between John Flansburg and Robin Goldwasser. Interestingly, this song is actually originally from Partly Cloudy Patriot, but has shown up once again here. I get why this EP is considered dark. It's definitely a lot darker than any of the stuff on the spine, and TMBG usually has more lighthearted stuff in between the dark stuff, whereas this EP is just all the dark stuff. But also, I don't know, some of the marketing around it as being the creepiest record ever and their Halloween EP, I don't know, I don't totally buy it. But honestly, I just wish some of these songs had ended up on the spine. That album really could have used some of the grit this EP has to offer. A tier. The Spine Hits the Road. The third and final release in The Spine naming format, The Spine Hits the Road was an iTunes exclusive live album that compiled various performances from across the Spine tour of the same name. The Spine Hits the Road is a live compilation album released exclusively to iTunes that features performances from the tour of the same name. Like any live album that's based around a certain tour for a certain album, I wish there were more of the album tracks present here, but only 5 of the 11 tracks are from The Spine, which to be fair is a pretty good ratio considering what we've gotten in the past. Everything else is either from No 
or from older works by TMBG. The only thing that really stands out to me about this album is the live version of Fingertips. Uh, during the I Don't Understand You song, the Johns break into this little no understando bit, which just makes me laugh a little bit. It's an alright live album. C tier. Almanac. Another Spine Era live compilation, Almanac doesn't follow the Spine naming format, but it does aesthetically match with a lot of the same stuff that was going on with the band around the same time. Of the 19 tracks, six of them are tracks from the Spine, though I don't mind this as much because this isn't a The Spine labeled project. This is also a live compilation album that would get pulled from a lot for other releases. Some of the bonus tracks on the No 2012 digital re-release are from Almanac, and some of the live tracks show up as bonus tracks on other albums as well. This version of Clap Your Hands has some really great energy to it, and Linnell is clearly having so much fun with the autotune effect on his voice on Bastard Wants to Hit Me. There is a little bit of crossover with The Spine Hits the Road in terms of what songs are being presented here. In fact, both John Lee Superstar and I Palindrome I are the same performances from The Spine Hits the Road. Overall, I like Almanac more than I like The Spine Hits the Road, and this version of Fingertips also has the No Understando bit, so yeah, I'd say this is much more worth it, and more readily available too. C tier. Here come the ABCs. Hot off the success of No, and a desire to keep the band financially stable, a deal was struck with Disney to make more kids' albums, specifically educational ones. The first of these three that would be released was Here Come the ABCs in 2005. Due to being recorded around the same time as The Spine, it has a similar sound, but with a little bit more electronic sounds going on. However, there are some production aspects that are outright strange to me. For example, on both Flying V and D&W, Linnell's voice seems to be mixed just way too loud, and across the whole project, the drums always seem just a little bit too quiet. I often wonder if this was done at Disney's request to make the album more appealing to kids by having a less aggressive drum sound that's not as punchy and focusing more on just the vocals. I suppose there would be audio engineering considerations having to be made for kids since kids can hear more high frequencies than adults and maybe that would somehow impact their mixing and recording decisions. I don't know, I don't know what goes into making an album aimed at children. Despite being made for kids, there are some really good songs on here. Alphabet of Nations, Flying V, which has some great piano work on it, QU, Pictures of Pandas Painting, Can You Find It, I See You, which has a fun little concept to it where every word being sung is just the sound of a letter, but it still comes across as a whole cohesive story. I think they did a really good job on that one. Letter Shapes, Rolling O, Elemento, and ZYX. There's also some songs that are not sung by the Johns. Who Put the Alphabet in Alphabetical Order is sung by Robin Goldwasser, and the next instance of a non-John member of the band writing and singing a song on a kid's album, Marty Beller sung and wrote the song Alphabet Lost and Found. There are also some non-ABC themed bonus tracks that I find interesting. Hovering Sombrero 05 is a remake of the song from Mint Card done up in a very interesting style. Nostalgia definitely affects my opinion of the Here Comes the Blank series of albums, but I do find Here Come the ABCs to be my least favorite of the three. C tier. Or more like ABC tier. Am I right? <laughs> T-shirt. Originally meant to be included on Here Come the ABCs, but getting lost in the fray, T-shirt ended up being released as an iTunes exclusive single. It's kind of TMBG doing a sort of Led Zeppelin sound. It's a lot heavier than anything else on the Here Come the ABCs album, that's for sure. I also enjoy the story of the lyrics. A squirrel is saving up acorns to buy a t-shirt to keep his family warm in the winter. Yeah, that's just a fun concept, I don't know. C-tier. 
or more like A B C tier. I already did this joke. Venue songs. As a way to make the tours more interesting, the band started writing songs about each venue they would be playing. These were recorded from the sound desk, and a select few of the songs were re-recorded in the studio. This gave us 2005's Venue Songs. This is one of TMBG's longest albums. The first 11 tracks are the studio re-recordings of the Venue Songs, tracks 12 through 16 are some rarities and b-sides, and tracks 17 to 46 being the live versions of the Venue Songs. Some of the Venue Songs end up being more like style parodies of other bands. For a short example, Dallas sounds like progressive rock band Yes, Vancouver sounds like pop rock band The Cars, and Leeds sounds like The Who. The highlight tracks for me are definitely Dallas, Albany, Anaheim, Vancouver, Pittsburgh, Glasgow, Asbury Park, Renew My Subscription, Tippy Canoe and Tyler 2, Leeds, and Charleston. The songs can be really fun and catchy, but honestly the album really, really drags in the middle. It can be tough to listen to this one all the way through from start to finish. This album just usually ends up being like last on my list of TMBG albums I would pick to listen to. D tier. <laughs> More like A, B, C, D tier. It doesn't work with this album. The Else. As TMBG continued to work on kids' albums for Disney, all the darker, more adult subjects they'd usually be writing about got channeled into one place. 2007's The Else. This is a more rock-focused album, like The Spine, but unlike The Spine, it's got a little bit more energy and excitement and some more brightness to the sound. I'd go through and list the songs that I think are highlights, but then I would just be listing the entire track list of the album. Each song is unique with a strong hook and concept, and the sound is consistently good, especially with what is some of Danny Weinkoff's best bass playing that he's ever done with the band. This can be a little bit of a black sheep among TMBG's studio albums. It is the only one, as far as I know, to not feature any accordion, something that is quite a staple for the band. And it's steeped in the political commentary of the time, being very much a response to the Bush administration and the Iraq war. Honestly though, between the great songs and great production, some of which was done by the Dust Brothers, I really like this album. S tier. S tier, more like A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K. Cast Your Pod to the Wind. Originally a bonus disc that was packed with the else, Cast Your Pod to the Wind compiles songs from They Might Be Giants' podcast project that was going on at the time. The best way I can describe this album is, what if the else was more goofy? And I mean that in a good way. There are some really fun songs here. I'm Your Boyfriend Now, We Live in a Dump, Brain Problem Situation, Microphone, Vestibule, Greasy Kid Stuff, Employee of the Month, My Other Phone is a Boom Car, I Hear a New World, Haunted Floating Eye, and the titular, Cast Your Pod to the Wind, are all a really great and fun set of songs. I do find that the album drags a little bit in the middle though, but that doesn't stop me from loving it. A tier. More like A. Here come the one, two, threes. The second of the three Disney sound records, released in 2008 as Here Come the One, Two, Threes. Right off the bat, this is a really special TMBG album. It's the only one to feature at least one song written by every member of the band. Danny Weinkoff wrote and sung the song Number Two, Marty Beller wrote and sang High Five, and Dan Miller wrote and sings the song Infinity. This is really unprecedented in the whole TMBG discography, and it's kind of cool to see. As for the songs written by John and John, the ones that really stand out to me are One Everything, Triops, Apartment 4, The Secret Life of Six, Seven, Figure Eight, 813 Mile Car Trip, Nonagon, which has this fun little theme of every geometric shape that comes in gets a little background uh, blippy sound for how many sides they have, 
and even numbers. I'd put this album mostly on par with Here Come the ABCs, but I do enjoy it just a little bit more for some nostalgia factors, so it's going in B tier. Here comes science. Look out! Yonder in the distance! Here comes science! This final Disney sound record was released in 2009. It's aimed at a more mature, but still child audience when compared to the other two Here Come the Blank albums, though the production quality is much better in my opinion than ABC's and 123's. Some of my favorite songs are Science is Real, Meet the Elements, I Am a Paleontologist, which was written by Danny Weinkoff, Electric Car, My Brother the Ape, which has a great stylophone solo in it, very much like some of the songs on the Else, How Many Planets, Why Does the Sun Shine, which finally gets a studio recording of the more upbeat version, Cells, and Speed and Velocity, which is a Marty Beller song. This does feel like a bit of a weaker send-off to the Here Comes the Blank albums, you can kind of tell TMBG was running out of steam by this point for the project. I find that there are more duds on this album than the others, though with some nostalgia points, not nearly as many as 123's, and also enjoying the production of the album, I have to put this one in B tier. Kids Go Released as a single to go along with a book after premiering on PBS Kids, this song is about what it sounds like. It's one of those, Kids! Look! Here is music! Dance! Move! Stop! Sitting around watching television! And move! It's an okay song. I can appreciate the message and intent behind it. C tier. Chapter 5, Some Other Band Tired of the commercial work of the 2000s, TMBG sought to gain more financial independence in a world where the music industry had kind of begun to cannibalize itself. Services like Spotify would take away major amounts of income from artists' recorded work. The solution TMBG came up with was the Instant Fan Club, better known as the IFC. This is a subscription that's brought around every few years where fans can pay an upfront amount, usually at various different tier levels, and receive exclusive merchandise and music. The thing is, though, is that a lot of the material is supposed to be kept secret by members of the IFC. The oath of the fan club stating that if members are asked about the IFC, they are to respond with, you must be thinking of some other band. <laughs> This kind of creative freedom would really shape the upcoming years of the band, especially now that they didn't have to worry about exhaustive deadlines with, let's say, Disney. Join us. While the band had tried to keep up their normal album output while also working on the Disney Sound Kids records, it proved to be too much and what would eventually become 2011's Join Us was completely scrapped and the process started over. They wanted to get back to more of an independent and experimental sound. Ironically though, Join Us is one of, if not the most polished sounding record TMBG has put out to this day. At times, it can just sound a little bit too clean or a little bit too perfect. This doesn't mean the songs themselves are bad though. You Probably Get That A Lot has some of my favorite Linnell lyricism with the line, melting down army guys to make green tea. I just love the imagery of that line so much. Canna Jahari, Cloisonne, Let Your Hair Hang Down, Celebration, In Fact, Protagonist, Never Knew Love, Lady and the Tiger, Spoiler Alert, 2082, and You Don't Like Me all stand to some of my favorite songs from this record. There is a kind of creatively explosive energy that comes from this album, like once they restarted the process of making it, they were just invigorated to just create stuff. However, I find it just lacks that little bit of edge that I have come to love TMBG for. And in some ways, it feels like the band has been declawed on this album, despite how experimental it is. It manages to stray far from being a normal rock record, but somehow doesn't stray far enough. A tier.
Album raises new and troubling questions. Quickly released as a follow-up to join us, Album Raises New and Troubling Questions is a compilation of material that was cut from Join Us and some other rarities that hadn't had a major release yet. Even when it's just the offcuts, the songs are really good. Authenticity Trip, Marty Beller Mask, Now I Know, The Fellowship of Hell, Mountain Flowers, Money for Dope, Read a Book, and Havelina are all some really solid tracks. Not to mention we get the Other Thing version of Boat of Car, the only time this version of the song has been released. Sometimes I wonder if this song should have been a mini-album or even a longer EP, as some of the non-Join Us offcuts can just be kind of uninteresting. But honestly though, I'm just really glad some of this cut material got a major release. Who knows what caves we would have had to fish in to find this material otherwise. B tier. At Large. At Large is a live compilation album with performances taken from across the tour for Join Us. Unfortunately, there's no horn section present, and some of these songs could really benefit from it especially When Will You Die and Withered Hope. Though it is really cool to hear live versions of Judy Is Your Vietnam, Careful What You Pack, and Santa's Beard. And to me, that's really where this album stands out, is some of the else tracks that get presented live. As most other live albums, the only else song you ever hear is The Mesopotamians, which is a good song, but some of these other ones are really good. Overall, it's a fine live compilation, but it's not my favorite. C tier. Four covers from TMBG. A vinyl EP that was sold exclusively at shows around 2012. Four covers from TMBG is exactly what it says on the tin. It's four covers from TMBG. Most of these songs had been released elsewhere, but Up the Junction is exclusive to this release. The songs are okay. Uh, their cover of Very Good Year is pretty funny. And I really like the chorus on Concrete and the Clay, but they didn't write that chorus, but they do a good job performing it. Overall, it's a pretty unremarkable release. D tier. Nanobots. Following up Join Us is 2013's Nanobots. This album tones down the polish and brings up the experimentation. This album also sees the return of micro songs from Apollo 18, though instead of being one big suite, uh, they're kind of just peppered throughout the album and they're not as solid as fingertips were. I find that Nanobots suffers from the same thing that a lot of TMBG's better albums do, which is that while there are very, very high highs on the album, there are some low lows. <clears throat> Tesla, <clears throat> Black Ops. <clears throat> <clears throat> Sorry about that. But the good songs? Whoa, the good songs. You're on Fire, Lost My Mind, Circular Karate Chop, Call You Mom, Stone Cold Coup d'etat, Sometimes a Lonely Way, Nine Secret Steps, The Darlings of Lumberland, and Icky. All oh, these songs are so good. Honestly, despite the huge contrast in quality on this album, I just love it so much. It just, it stands out and it's unafraid to be nanobots. S tier. Asbury Park Live. Recorded in 2013 but not released until 2022, Asbury Park Live is TMBG performing a show at Asbury Park during the Nanobots tour. This show is pretty notable because it's the first time TMBG performed the better version of Black Ops, which is way more high energy than the Nanobots version. We also get a pretty fun People vs. Apes segment, which is a bit that TMBG would do at their shows where the audience gets divided in half and then one half are the people, the other half are the apes, and the people chant when uh, Dan, Danny, and Marty play, and then the apes chant when John and John play, and it's this whole like improv back and forth battle. It's really fun to listen to, and I can't imagine what it would be like to be in that show live and just how crazy it must feel. The performance of Lost My Mind is also really good, and the way they do Istanbul, not Constantinople on this tour, and in this show especially, <laughs> you just have to hear it. It's kinda wild. And the second half of the show adds a horn section! 
Call You Mom, Turn Around, The Guitar, and Withered Hope, ooh, with horns, so much better. This is a really solid live album and definitely worth a listen. A tier. The Avatars of They. I feel like I should have like a sock on my hand while I do this. One second. All right, here we go. This is my tribute to the avatars of they. So around the time of nanobots, TMBG had this gimmick of bringing sock puppets on stage with them and dedicating a little segment of the show to them. These were known as the avatars of they. The gimmick didn't last forever, but they were so beloved by fans that TMBG put together a little vinyl EP in 2013 featuring songs written and sung by the avatars of they. The songs aren't good, but it's clearly the Johns having fun with music. And who can say no to having fun? The EP also captures a kind of lo-fi sound that's more reminiscent of old dial-a-song recordings or demos. It's not terrible, but it's also not great. C tier. All right, uh, you can go now. Go? Why would I go? Where would I go? I don't know. Away? Why don't you go away? This is my video. Why can't it be my video? Because I've already filmed, like, most of it so far. You just showed up. Yeah, but I'm kind of liking it here. This bit isn't good, and honestly, it's already gone on for way too long. You need to leave. But I want to stay. All right, hold on a second. I have to kill this puppet. We're good now. First album live. Not released until 2014, but recorded in 2013 across two different shows, first album live is exactly what it sounds like. It's fun to hear the modern, full band arrangements of these old tape machine songs. Hideaway Folk Family, Hotel Detective, and Absolutely Bill's Mood are done really well. And Toddler Highway even gets an extended version, sung by the previously mentioned Avatars of They. I'm still alive. <laughs> Would you shut up? C tier. Flood, live in Australia. Recorded across multiple shows in 2013, Flood, live in Australia, presents the Flood album in reverse track order, which is often how it's performed live. It's pretty much exactly what it sounds like. It's TMBG performing Flood live. And the audience is Australian, if that makes a difference. I particularly like the live arrangements of Whistling in the Dark and Hearing Aid, as they seem to feature what sounds like a stylophone, which I just always love to hear. There's also some fun vocalization on Minimum Wage, and Linnell's singing on We Wanna Rock is really good. C tier. Chapter 6, Dial-A-Song. In the 2000s, TMBG struggled to keep Dial-A-Song alive. The aging equipment that had no new replacements was beginning to fail. They tried to find a replacement for the service altogether in the form of the They Might Be Giants podcast. However, this proved to not last forever, and by the 2010s, both dial -a song and the podcast were dead. And so, in 2015, the band decided to bring back dial -a song in a whole new way. Throughout the year, they would release one new song every week online. They even found a modern system for running the phone component of dial -a song allowing people to once again call in and hear the new music, albeit on a different phone number than the original dial -a song the songs would be uploaded to YouTube and the Dial-A-Song website. However, fans could choose to pay $50 at the start of the year to get a download of every song that would get released. This Dial-A-Song Direct program was also included as a perk in all of the IFC memberships for that year, in some ways making the Dial-A-Song Direct kind of a discounted version of the IFC with only the Dial-A-Song Direct songs. By the end of 2015, 
over 70 tracks had been released through the service. This was due to some bonus tracks getting released on Fridays, which bumped the count above the 52 that you would expect. Most of these songs would get split up across three studio albums that TMBG would release in 2015, with the last one technically being in 2016. This proved to be so fruitful that in 2018, the band would do it again! However, by the end of the year, they would only get out a total of 40 tracks, not even making the 52 minimum that you would expect for having one song every week. The 2018 Dial-A-Song also resulted in three studio albums, this time all of them being released in 2018. For this video, I won't be counting Dial-A-Song Direct 2015 and Dial-A-Song Direct 2018 as albums to be ranked, as they aren't technically part of the discography. This does mean that there are some songs that never got released to an album that won't be reviewed here. Glean First up of the Dial-A-Song 2015 albums is Glean. Production-wise, TMBG had gotten pretty consistent after Join Us, so the sound of this album is about what you'd expect if you've ever heard Nanobots. As for the songs, I think Flans really shines here. Good To Be Alive, Music Jail, Madam I Challenge You To A Duel, All The Lazy Boyfriends, Hate The Villanelle, I'm A Coward, and Let Me Tell You About My Operation are some of the best songs on this album. As for Linnell, Underwater Woman, I Can Help The Next In Line, Answer, End Of The Rope, and Erase are all really good tracks too, but they don't stand out as much as the Flans tracks. Overall, Glean definitely has a strong pop-rock energy to it that Flans seems to harness really, really well. In some ways, it's a lot like Flood in the sense that it's a very digestible album, though I do find it just has a little bit more spice to it than Flood. A tier. Why? Second up on the Dial-A-Song 2015 album list is Why. At the time, this was TMBG's first non-Disney kids record in over a decade. It's a bit similar to No, it focuses on music for kids that aren't necessarily about an educational topic, but just music aimed at children. However, it seems to be aimed at even a younger audience than No was, uh, being just way less dark and creepy than No. Despite this, there are some highlight songs for sure. Omnicorn, I Am Invisible, Definition of Good, or So I Have Read, which in my mind kind of acts like a kid-friendly version of the song Ah from Glean. I Haven't Seen You in Forever has this really cool echoing melody that I really enjoy. The pretty funny song Out of a Tree and the song Mrs. We Like is a lyrical puzzle that comes together as the song goes on. This album has a really good energy to it. It feels encouraging and joyous and wondrous and like the songs are more about getting kids to use their brains and imagination versus just presenting them with material. And even though I didn't grow up with this album and I don't have any nostalgia for it, it still always leaves a smile on my face. B tier. Particle Man, live at NOLA Studios. A quick detour from the main Dial-A-Song 2015 albums to take a look at Particle Man live at NOLA Studios. This song has been released in a few different ways since its recording in the early 2000s, however its most recent incarnation was in the Dial-A-Song 2015 as a bonus track. Now I know I said I wouldn't be covering any of the material that was from the Dial-A-Song program that wasn't put to an album. This is the one exception though, as this song is available to buy off the They Might Be Giants merch store for like a dollar as a digital download. Sometimes it even becomes free for a little bit. And while it's not counted under the This Might Be a Wiki discography section, it can be bought on its own currently. Therefore, in my head, it counts as a release that should be included here. It's pretty basic. Uh, the Johns do a version of Particle Man that's clearly very Beatles-inspired with a Mellotron and very funny Beatles-esque accents. Pretty much it's just if, what if the Beatles sang Particle Man? It's a fine version of the song. B-tier. Phone Power. The final studio album from Dial-A-Song 2015 wouldn't actually get a release until early 2016. This is Phone Power. 
This album is a lot darker and grittier than Glean, with less of an upbeat pop sound and more of an experimental rock sound. While Flans was shining on Glean, Linnell really takes center stage on phone power. Apophenia, I Love You For Psychological Reasons, I Am Alone, Trouble, Awful, Devil, Evil, one of my favorite TMBG songs of all time, Snilly Man, It Said Something, I'll Be Haunting You, What Did I Do To You, and Shapeshifter are just astounding tracks on this album. Flans has some good material too, Daylight and Impossibly New are exceptionally good songs, Two of Forest is pretty good as well, and it's great to finally have a studio recording of the better, fast version of Black Ops. I think if you took the Flan songs from Glean and the Linnell songs from Phone Power and stuck them together, you'd end up with a much less cohesive, but much better album. But as it stands in their separated states, I find Phone Power to be the best that dial a song 2015 had to offer. S tier. Live at the Music Hall of Williamsburg, November 29th, 2015. Throughout 2015, with all the excitement of dial song coming back, TMBG would play a unique show at the Music Hall of Williamsburg in New York every month for the entire year. November's show featured two sets. The first set was John on guitar, John on accordion, and a tape machine, the first time they had played in the duo format since the early 90s. This was followed by a second set that featured the entire band. This live show was recorded and eventually released in 2020 as Live at the Hall of Williamsburg 11 15 and is, I think, currently still available for free if you sign up for TMBG's mailing list. The interesting thing to me is that all of the backing tracks that play on the tape machine behind John and John in the first set of the show are brand new. Like, it makes sense for some of the newer songs, like Trouble, Awful, Devil, Evil, or Impossibly New, that they'd be able to create, you know, easily create new backing tracks. But they have new backing tracks for old songs like Don't Let's Start and Youth Culture Killed My Dog. Clearly a ton of effort went into the preparation of this show, and I have to respect it a lot even just on that. There are some really great performances here, too. Snowball in Hell, Trouble Awful Devil Evil, Impossibly New, They'll Need a Crane, Daylight, Wearing a Raincoat, We Live in a Dump, I Can Help the Next in Line, Damn Good Times, Let Me Tell You About My Operation, and the encores of Robot Parade, The Guitar, and Istanbul Not Constantinople are just so astoundingly high energy. It, it's crazy how great of a finish the end of this show is. This, to me, is the best live album TMBG has ever put out. The set list spans so many albums from the band, with only a couple not being represented. It basically acts like a live greatest hits show. This really makes it the perfect introductory live album to They Might Be Giants for any new fan. Because, of course, as this is one whole show and not just a live compilation, there is tons of hilarious stage banter that can introduce you to the personality of the Johns, as well as the great music. There's also a really great contrast in the energy of the duo set versus the full band set. In the duo set, the Johns almost perform a little shyly and nervously, like it's strange not having all the other musicians around. But then the full band set begins and it just explodes. Their confidence and energy are just way up there, and it's really fun to see that. Really, I think any TMBG fan should listen to this album, whether you're new to the band or not. It is perfection. S tier. I like fun. The first of the Dial a Song 2018 albums. I Like Fun parallels the dark and more political tone of the else. The sound of the album is much bigger and heavier than any of the dial song 2015 stuff, and is even a little bit higher quality, though unfortunately the rest of the dial song 2018 projects won't really hold up that sense of quality. One of the things that really shocked me as I was listening through all the albums for this video is just how many of the words to this album I knew. I had never really made a conscious effort to learn the words to these songs, but there I was singing along to practically the first three-fourths of the album. And I think that stands as a testament to just how good these songs are. Much like the else, I'm not going to list my favorite songs because I love all of them. 
though I will make one exception and list Push Back the Hands of Time because, ooh, that is such a good song. The flow of the track listing is also really good. Every song just flows really well into the next one. I think I Like Fun might just be one of the best albums of the 2010s to come out of They Might Be Giants. S tier. My Murdered Remains. The second Dial a Song 2018 album, My Murdered Remains, is much less of an album and more of a compilation. It collects most of, though not all, of the Dial a Song 2018 tracks that didn't make it to a different album. And it even collects some more Dial a Song 2018 and 2015 tracks on the bonus disc known as More Murdered Remains. Now, you could technically count My Murdered Remains and More Murdered Remains as two different albums the way that Cast Your Pod to the Wind was a bonus disc featured with The Else. However, when you buy The Else from the They Might Be Giants website, you don't get a copy of Cast Your Pod to the Wind, you have to buy that separately. When you buy My Murdered Remains, you get the More Murdered Remains download. And there's no way to buy More Murdered Remains as its own thing, so I'm not counting it as its own thing, it's just an extension to My Murdered Remains. Though also much like Cast Your Pod to the Wind, there's a much greater contrast in how good the songs are. Not every song's a winner here. Though The Communists Have the Music, I've Been Seeing Things, Dog, Ampersand, Applause, The Neck Rolls Aren't Working, Sectionalist, I Haven't Been Right Yet, Tractor, Tick, This Is Only Going to Go One Way, Starry Eyes, Best Regrets, Thankful for Your Service, Summer Breeze, Another Weirdo, and Door to Door Minotaur are definitely some of the best songs across the two discs. I really like how wild and strange these songs are. It feels like this album has a bit more room to breathe than I Like Fun, though I do wish every song hit as hard as it does on I Like Fun. A tier. The Escape Team. The third and final Dial a Song 2018 album, The Escape Team, is a collaboration where the Johns and David Coles came up with various characters. The Johns would write songs about them, and David Coles would write a one-shot comic book about them. If I had to describe The Escape Team in one word, it would be unfinished. The comic is short and doesn't really have much of a story. It's kind of just these two people walk down a hallway where all the characters are and they just introduce them one by one. Here's this character. Here's this character. Here's and then it ends and spoiler alert, they all break out of the prison they're in. That's it. That's the whole book. And the album is also shorter than any TMBG album ever released. Technically by the band it's classified as being a mini album which essentially just translates to a kind of longer EP, more on par with, like, The Spine Surfs Alone. Oh, and not to mention, the album is missing a song. The character, Hair Ned, didn't get a song because they didn't have time to make one. They said they would make one later, and they never did. So there's this awkward incongruity between the characters you see in the comic and who's presented in the album. The songs also feel a bit rushed, they sound more like demos made in the John's home studios than like finished products that they usually put out on their albums. And it really adds to the feeling that Dial a Song 2018 just wasn't as fleshed out as Dial a Song 2015. Some of the songs though are still pretty good. Chip the Chip, John Postal, Repeat Offender, and The Poisonousness, which is definitely the best song on the album. I think there is a fun concept at the heart of the escape team, like there's a good idea, it just wasn't executed very well, or, or it was executed too quickly. I don't know what exactly went wrong here, but it just doesn't hit the mark. D tier. Chapter 7. Now is Strange. In the aftermath of the massive output of the dial -a song revivals, they Might Be Giants would once again shake up how they release their music. Along with the IFC, more and more music is being released exclusively to the band's website as digital downloads. And their, at the time of making this, latest album comes with a book. It's not as easy to put a definable point on this time period of the band as it's still currently happening, 
but the Johns seem as determined as ever to continue making great music even as they age gracefully into their 60s. Who are the electors? A single written for CNN, Who are the electors, tells the facts and history of the Electoral College in the United States. But it does so through a sneer. Small lyrical jabs emphasize that it's up to them and not up to us. We're only the voters, they are the electors. Which to me shows an amount of disdain for how presidential election is set up in the US. The song itself is pretty good. I especially enjoy the guitar riffs that play in the verse. And as an educational song, it does its job pretty well. I enjoy the mixture of a straight presentation of facts with a little hint of opinion thrown in there. B tier. Book. Released in 2021, and currently TMBG's most recent album, Book picks up where I Like Fun left off sonically, but continues on with a little more experimentation. The band has always covered dark topics in their music, but while usually it comes across as a sort of darkness from a distance, a wink, a nod, a smile, here the darkness feels much more intimate and close. It also comes with a book! The book part of book contains lyrics printed in typewriter art from the albums Book, I Like Fun, and My Murdered Remains. There's also some photos, but they're not strictly relevant to the songs. I wouldn't say this is an integral part of listening to the album. Uh, the lyrics aren't even in the same order as they're presented in the album, so you can't just like flip through the pages and always be in line with where the album is. It's also missing a song. Drown the Clown doesn't have a set of lyrics in here. As for the songs, the standouts to me are Moonbeam Rays, I Broke My Own Rule, Lord Snowden, If Day Is For Winnipeg, I Can't Remember The Dream, Drown the Clown, I Lost Thursday, Part Of You Wants To Believe Me, Super Cool, Quit The Circus, and Less Than One. Honestly though, I enjoy all the songs on this album, though it's hard to find one that really stands out in a specific way. I'll also say that Flansburg is definitely the highlight of this album. His material is just so fresh here, and it really gets me excited for what he's going to do going forward into the 2020s. And I hope this encourages Linnell to be a little bit fresher on the next album, too. Overall, Book is a good album, but it's not the best. B tier. I Can't Remember the Dream, Alternate Version. This is an alternate version of I Can't Remember the Dream from Book. It's exclusive to download from They Might Be Giant's website. It changes the orchestration to leading with a banjo instead of an electric guitar, and the drums sound a bit more open. I also really like Linnell and Flans' vocals. Uh, they're single-tracked instead of double-tracked, so you just get more of like a close, raw feeling, which I kind of like more than the album version. B tier. The Pamphlet EP. A couple extra songs from the book sessions were compiled onto They Might Be Giant's first EP in quite a few years, The Pamphlet. There's only four songs on here, and they're all relatively short, leading to one of the shortest EPs they've put out. The four songs are Helicopter of Elves, Buckle Down Winsaki, There Will Be Sad, and Fortnite. No, not that Fortnite. There Will Be Sad is by far my favorite song on this EP, and I really wish it had been included on book because it really would have boosted my opinions of Linnell's output on that album. This EP is fine, and it's definitely worth it for There Will Be Sad, but overall it's kind of mediocre. C tier. Hearing Aid, alternate version. This alternate version of Flood's song, Hearing Aid, was created as a mid-set walk-on for the 2020 TMBG Flood Tour. It has since been released exclusively as a download on the TMBG merch site. It's an electronic take on the song, which does sound pretty good, but it cuts out the original horn melody, and I find myself really missing that. Honestly though, I would love an original song to show up in this style on TMBG's next album, because Flans clearly knows how to do it quite well. C tier. Lazy. 
TMBG's most recent release, a cover of Irving Berlin's Lazy created for the WNYC Public Domain Song Project in 2024. Like We've Got a World That Swings, TMBG chooses to cover the song with a toy piano. Filling out the rest of the arrangement is Dan, Danny, and Marty on electric guitar, electric bass, and drums, respectively. I really like the way Linnell and Flans' vocals were produced on this song. They sound really warm and close, and I hope this production choice continues on to the next album. It's a pretty good song, and they do a good job covering it. B tier. And so, we've come to the end. They Might Be Giants is a band that really means a lot to me, and I hope I've done a good enough job getting that across in this video. The melodies are beyond catchy, and the lyrics are so fun to bite into. The humor and attitude of the band keep you singing along with a smile, even when the darkest of subject matter is being sung about. I know that not every fan is going to agree with my ranking, and that's okay. And quite frankly, I'd love to see what other fans have to say in the comments, even if you think I'm wrong at every turn. And if you're new to the band, I hope you've enjoyed this lengthy discussion, and I hope I've been able to provide some more history and background on them for you. And if you've never listened to They Might Be Giants, I hope this video encourages you to check them out. If you like the style of video here and you want to see more of what I'm going to be making in the future, why not uh, click that old subscribe button? And if you've liked the video or disliked the video, the related buttons for those feelings are also down below. With all that being said, I'm Casey from the iLog channel, and this is me, signing out. Bye now. Mm -hmm.